Thank you, Hannah. Um, so like Hannah mentioned, today we are joined by Steve Tennis. He's the owner of the Country Mill right here in Charlotte. Um, the Tennis family has been on the farm for what I hear is the 50th year this year. Um, they offer everything from apples to pumpkins, blueberries, peaches, and sunflowers um, in their UPIC operation. They're also meat verified, uh, certified organic in parts of their orchard, and they participate in many projects throughout the community. Um, so we're really excited to have Steve with us today. So welcome, Steve, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I briefly mentioned a little bit about the farm's history and how you guys have been there for now 50 years. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about the background of the farm and what you guys are currently offering? Sure, absolutely. Well, Allie, thanks for having me on today. Um, so yes, uh, our family has been stewards of this land for now 50 years. And I use the word stewards intentionally because I think it goes well with the, what the Eaton Conservation District is all about and the great work you guys do down in your office there um, because we have this land, they're not making any more land and we really just gotta take care of it to continue to uh, have it for future generations. So uh, before I talk about what we currently offer, I wanna go back even deeper into history because this land here uh, was originally owned in the mid 1800s by the Upright family. And Paul Upright is actually um, a neighboring farmer right across the road. And his family had farmed, his descendants had farmed um, his ancestors, I should say, had farmed this land. And the picture you see behind me uh, of the sunflowers actually goes back to what something uh, the uprights had done uh, with people in your office that I'll talk about a little bit later. But so the farm started in the mid 1800s uh, with dairy, apples, and like many uh, farms, you know, of course, livestock. And then we focused through the years on apples. And so in 1971, 50 years ago, my father, uh, my mom bought 80 acres out here of orchard that was already in existence. It was already operating as a country mill in 1971. And they were pressing cider, making donuts in the little tiny area that we call the cider bar. So if you've ever been to the country mill, if you go in to like sit down and have a donut, that little tiny room was the whole, uh, place in 1971 and so from there we've grown and we've grown because of partnerships like the Eaton Conservation District and NRCS and the other local uh, nonprofits that we try to work with here in the area so we have now grown from 80 acres to 213 acres and on that land we grow uh, apples as our primary uh, crop the apples are about 40 acres. And then we also have 16 acres of sunflowers, about 16 acres of uh, corn maize on any given year. We have 20 acres of pumpkins, a few acres of squash. We have four acres of blueberries and then about two acres of peaches. So again, our main crops are apples, blueberries, peaches, pumpkins, sunflowers. But um, of course, what we really sell out here is family fun. The opportunity for people to come out and enjoy all these fun things and learn about agriculture. Yeah, and I can, personally, I can attest to, we come out there, my family comes at least two or three times a year for apples and pumpkins. And um, we had my son this year, so we took him out for sunflowers too, which is really fun for a baby to see and just <laughs> open his bright eyes to all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I love it there. Um, but it sounds like with all the different things that you grow, all the different um, commodities and products, you obviously have different ag management practices too that you have to do, which I can imagine can be a little bit intensive. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the management of one of your crops? Sure. Um, well, so yeah, let me back up a little bit. You mentioned we have some organic. So we do have about half the orchard is organic, uh, the apple orchard, about half of our peaches are certified organic. And our blueberries are in the final transition uh, to going organic. And so that is something we do. Um, you know, there's a lot of, people have a lot of opinions on organic, not organic. As a farmer, one of our goals has always been, even since the 1970s, to grow our crops with the fewest number of off-farm inputs. 
And what does that mean? I mean, that means I don't want to have to buy things from somewhere else to, to help grow our crop if we can help it. So we use a lot of things like we use wood chips, which are biodegradable. They come from local uh, tree trip, tree trimming and removal uh, places. And so we could use those under the, uh, like under the uh, canopy of the apples and the peaches, not only to help suppress weeds, but then they actually decay and they can help add organic matter right underneath the trees where we really need the organic matter. We use um, products from not too far from here, from Herbrooks, the chicken uh, place where we all eat eggs. And um, so right up there on like N66 and I-96, I think most of us have seen those giant buildings. So we get some of their poultry manure and then that goes out usually like in March to help with the fertility of the like the apples, organic apples and the peaches and the blueberries. So we use that there as well. And so fruit trees like apples and peaches are a good example where you try to put, you know, put on your uh, fertilizers sometimes in March, April, right before they start needing it uh, in the spring. We try to suppress weeds. In this case, we use like the wood chips to cover up um, any potential weeds that may germinate. And then we come back, uh, you know, in May and June. And of course, we were mowing underneath the trees any weeds that may have escaped, you know, before we, you know, your, your family comes out to enjoy picking their own apples or peaches. Right, absolutely. Um, so a lot of people might not be familiar with MEEP um, and how we really promote obviously best management practices to protect the soil and nearby water and groundwater. Um, and what you just described are those practices exactly. Um, so when you were joining the MEAT program, what, what factors com contributed to you to decide to participate in it, I guess? That's a great question. When we were first learning about MEAT, I saw it as an opportunity to continue to learn. A lot of us go to school for different professions. We learn things and, you know, sometimes there's this, you know, for some of us, we can all be lazy in a way, you know, we can all be like, oh, I already know that. I don't need to know about it. I'm, I'm moving on. Well, for those of us that may be in an industry for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, things evolve and you got to keep learning to stay current. And so at the time I was fresh out of Michigan State University after getting a master's degree on horticulture, I learned a lot of things there that are helping us now here and I realized that MEEP was really kind of like continuing education in a way like I was learning things from experts in your office um, about how to protect the groundwater how to you know guard against a potential fuel spill and all these things are like you know what this is a good idea I need to do this and so it's one of those things that's important but it's never urgent you know, to get meat and verified, but it's important in the long run. And that helps prevent future um, situations where you may look back and like, man, I wish I would have got meat and verified uh, before this and made a few of these little changes that would really help, you know, our farm operation. So for us, I was glad because we identified, we put some secondary containment, basically a, around a, a diesel fuel area. We made sure our diesel fuel area was far enough away from our drinking water that we use to make our donuts and all of our fun bakery products. And then um, we actually eventually, working through the um, USDA's Natural Resources and Conservation Service with Tim in your office, we were able to uh, build a building just to help hold our fertilizers and any inputs we put on our crops. And so that kept it all separated away from what we do with making the cider and vinegar and all the goodies in a different building. So it really helped us kind of look at things holistically uh, to make sure not only that we comply, but then we do things more efficiently as a farm. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of how you mentioned it, it's not, um, it's not a quick fix or anything, or it's not something that can be, you know, accomplished overnight necessarily, but the really important thing is the sustainability in the long run, um, what you're doing to make sure your farm stays in operation and, everything you're offering the public is safe and will be for years to come. So that's what, that's what I always like to preach about meat, but I'm glad <laughs> one of our meat farmers can also attest to that. Um, so that's really awesome to hear. But what we always talk about is how MEEP is the continued commitment to natural resource conservation. Um, so if everybody kind of shared the same sentiment, you know, our 
country and our state could be so much more um, efficient in the preserving of water quality and soil quality and soil health in general. Um, so if you were able to give a farm that was on the fence about committing to MEEP or participating in MEEP, what would you say to kind of convince them to get the ball rolling? Well, I think first thing that people have to learn about uh, with me or know is that it's, it's non-regulatory, it's voluntary. They can check out, I guess, any point along the road if they don't feel comfortable. So, and what I mean by that is if they say, okay, I'll do this and they get in and they're like, oh man, I got to do all these things. Well, you don't have to do them all at once. You know, the technician will help make a list and say, well, let's do these easy things first. Uh, and then let's think about how we're going to address this big issue over here. And it could be anything, but I would tell you that if a big issue is identified, you're going to want to take care of it eventually. Even if an individual farmer might be like, well, you know, I'm at a point where I'm almost retired. I don't want to deal with this. I understand that. My late father, you know, we were at that point where, you know, does he want to deal with it? No, but at some point, the next generation will have to take care of it. And so my father and I were able to work through that while he's living to address everything that needed to be taken care of before he passed so that he left a legacy for our family farm to continue on the right direction. So I would submit to you, if you, for growers that might be thinking, well, I'm about ready to sell the farm. This will only help you to have a better farm legacy after you're no longer farming. And so you wanna set things up well now. If you're on obviously middle age or, or younger coming in, you might as well start in the right direction now before, I mean, take like a fuel tank, for example. You know, it's a simple thing. Every farm needs diesel fuel. You know, where are you putting that? Where is it located? And so before you start like building on like, oh, now I have this and this year and this year, before you start doing that building, think about your overall plan first, your farm layout first, before you build another barn, before you put another you know, electricity here or there. That way, you have a big roadmap going forward. So I would suggest to the farmers, at least talk to a technician first, a meat technician, and start the ball rolling. Identify areas you may want to work on. And you might say, okay, I don't want to talk to them ever again. But at least now you know things that you may not be in compliance with if you ever, you know, something ever happened. You're like, well, you know, I didn't know about that. I should have done something about it, but I didn't. And so, again, it's non, it's voluntary and it's not punitive. It's like a no brainer. I think it's a great program. It's an example of our, our government trying to be proactive to help people along, kind of a carrot mentality instead of hitting us with a stick. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I hope anybody out there listening will take your advice kind of and get that, even if nothing else, it's a good knowledge base for you and your whole operation in general. Um, so at least even after that initial site visit, you decide you don't want anything to do with it. You know at least what you can do and what <laughs> could be done. Um, and I will add into that, you mentioned NRCS and um, with NRCS being right in our office, we are a, obviously a big partner with them. Um, and farmers that are involved with MEEP can also have the additional um, help towards an NRCS um, application if they decide they have a bigger project that they want to do or have different um, management practices in the field that they want to accomplish that they want some cost share for. So I don't know if you want to touch on that for a second. You said you worked with Tim um, and I'm sure MEEP and NRCS worked together at that point to help you start the NRCS process anyway. Right. I mean, the, be the beauty about Eaton Conservation District is your local, right? Your local run, local board. And then what Tim through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and NRCS brings to the table is obviously the federal assistance, okay? And so that really makes it nice when you can, as a farmer, A, you can identify the overall plan, you know, priorities, what things need to be done, what issues should be addressed, and then look and see, okay, how am I going to do that, okay? Am I going to pay for it all in my own pocket? Maybe. Or are there incentives there to start doing certain things that you already identified that you want to do, why not work with, you know, Tim down at your office to see if you can get some assistance to begin that process. And so we've been very fortunate. Uh, yes, we were able to uh, build a, a 
bale building basically that contains our fertilizer and the um, Tim's office was able to help pay for a majority of that uh, building, which is a real blessing for us. It allowed us again to do something we knew we needed to do, but it's hard to justify when you're looking at the full dollar amount. But when you have some assistance, some cost share, that really helps. The example behind me um, is a cover crop uh, that we started growing because Tim's office there helped our neighbor Paul up, right? Do some sun, a sunflower mix and a cover crop and our customers loved it. Uh, unfortunately, it was on Paul's property. So we had to make sure we started doing that on our property. And we had already done cover crops and rye, which we cover crop and, uh, you know, after pumpkins. But this was uh, just a, another tool in the toolbox for us to use in crop rotation and cover cropping that was like a win-win because people like taking pictures. And then like, even right now, these sunflowers are out in the field. They don't look as beautiful as they are right now, but they're they're maintaining the soil and the soil health here in March with all the snow and the runoff. And so, um, yeah, that's just another great example of how NRCS can help pay for a portion of the seed that you may use uh, for cover crops. Yeah, and we're, Tim and I and Sue at the district are really trying to um, get the ball rolling on a lot of cover crops with different farmers throughout the county. So it's always nice to hear <laughs> from, a farmer themselves, how it's working out for them. Um, so we really appreciate that, Steve, a little testimonial there. <laughs> um, but as Hannah mentioned earlier, we are celebrating 75 years at the district this year. Um, part of that is we're gonna be offering a lot of events throughout the year for our supporters. Um, and the big one, which we have coming up next week is the pruning workshop, which you have so graciously decided to help us with year after year. Um, so we're really excited about that. And there's always a great turnout. Uh, can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of um, an idea of what they can expect if they decide to join and listen to the workshop next week? Yes, absolutely. So for those of you listening that may have already come, obviously we would love to do it on site this year, but with COVID, we're still not able to do that quite yet. So we're going to cover some of the same material, but in a different format. We might be able to, um, to venture into some other fruits that sometimes people have questions on. And so we're, we'll see, we're gonna definitely do the apples. Apples kind of near pears a little bit. And then we're gonna touch a little bit on peaches. If you have peach trees, and then we might be able to get into blueberries just a little bit. So if you have any of those fruit trees in your backyard or grandma's yard, and you wanna prune some this spring, it's not too late to go pruning. You can still uh, watch the, the video on or after March 16th online via the Facebook page and then take those notes with you. So in many ways, it might be more helpful this year than any other year, because as we've all learned to use technology, you know, people can go back, rewatch, take notes, rewatch, take notes, go prune some, go back and rewatch again. <laughs> and so hopefully that's what we can kind of do this year is we'll have some slides, we'll be talking and, um, and then they can kind of see like what they should do, whether they have the, a giant 50 year old tree that needs a chainsaw or whether they have a two year old tree that they just bought last year, you know, from the Eaton Conservation District tree sale that whatever they may be, this pruning workshop is going to try to address it for you. Awesome. That's Thank great. you. I actually, we actually had a comment come in um, or a question, Steve, that I wanted to read and it said, do you feel that it's too late to prune fruit trees this year and you mentioned it's not. So is there a cutoff date that you have in mind um, of when you would no longer wanna prune your fruit trees? That's an excellent question. Uh, so right now is a great time to prune apples. You have apples, uh, but March 16th will not be too late. We start earlier as growers, um, mainly because we run out of time. And so you asked about when would it be too late? And so really about the time that the green tissue is coming out of the tree. We call that green tip, which is like when they first start to see green tissue coming out of that fruit tree, not necessarily like any tree, but that fruit type fruit tree, like apples. Uh, we'll get, you know, green tip would come out first. You know, peaches would be later, blueberries would be later. So if I had a bunch of fruit trees at my place, we were going to prune uh, apples first, then we're going to hit peaches, and then we'll do like blueberries last. And so that's just kind of how they come out of dormancy from their overwintering nap, if you will. And so 
because then what's happening is the sap, you know, the sap is literally coming up through the tree. The energy that was stored in the roots is now going into growing new tissue. And so what we as uh, farmers and backyard gardeners want to do is direct the tree's energy into the limbs that we want to keep, into the limbs that we want to promote growth at. And so that's why it's like you have a bank account and that it's all down the roots and you only have so much. So when it comes up, you want to make sure that the areas you don't want to spend that energy at are gone. So all that energy from the roots goes to where you want growth to happen. Hopefully that answered the question, Hannah. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you so much <laughs> for that. It's a good preview for next week. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, is there anything else, Hannah? Otherwise, I think the last thing I was just going to ask Steve is um, if there's anything else you wanted people to know about maybe what to expect uh, from you guys this year. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so like normal, uh, we are going to be open for business, uh, just like we were last year. With, um, around the end of July, we'll have pick your own blueberries, and then uh, we go into peaches, and then pick your own apples. But what's really new and different this year is the sunflowers you see behind us. We're going to, if you came out last year like you did, uh, we're going to actually increase the size of our sunflower patch by like three to four times. We're gonna have some different varieties. We're gonna allow people to come out for like senior pictures, family pictures, because Lord knows after this last 12 months, we all need to get out more. I think by August, um, this is gonna be a wonderful time to get out, get family pictures, and just enjoy the fresh air, regardless of what's happening with the COVID world, we should be in a much better spot. And at our farm, again, we're gonna be celebrating 50 years this year, um, and it's been, just awesome having fun since 1971 is is awesome for our family and we invite more families to come out starting august 1st that's super exciting and i know i look forward to it obviously but i'm sure many of our listeners do too um and with that i'll thank you steve if hannah if there's anybody else that comments questions that we need to answer um nope there's no other questions uh but if people do have any questions, feel free to drop them now in the comment section because um, I have Steve on for a few more minutes. In the meantime, I'll talk a little bit about our tree sale coming up um, and some of our other events. So tree sale is gonna be the weekend of April 23rd and 24th. And that's when pickup is at Cardell Hall at Eaton County Fairgrounds. And our pre-orders are due by March 25th. And our order form can be found online on our website at www.eatoncd.org. And I can um, type that in our uh, comment section right now. So you can go to the website for that. And then the other um, event that we have coming up is uh, our tree seedling giveaway, May 7th. That will be at Woldemore Nature Center. Um, we plan on giving out a couple of different varieties of seedlings, and that will be held from 3 to 7 p.m., and that will be in a drive through format. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I think that's it as far as events go for now. We do have another native plant sale coming up this year in June, um, and we will be hosting another one of these Eaton with Eaton events um, next, next month. And we will be talking a little bit about Arbor Day and some uh, cool things going on for that. <clears throat> and other than that, I think that is it. I haven't gotten any other questions, Steve. So um, I think we're good for now. But yeah, we look forward to having you next week on our tree pruning workshop. And I'm sure you're going to get a ton of questions for that. <laughs> that is good. I'm looking forward to your tree sale too, because that's a perfect time to plant trees when people are thinking right now, you know, what should I do in my backyard? We can talk a little bit about that at the end of the pruning workshop too, is where we, sh we should be planting the trees, the fruit trees specifically that we might get at the tree sale. But yeah, end of April, all of May is a great time to, to plant those trees. And so it's not too late to go order your trees and plant trees, and it's definitely not too late to prune. So for those of you listening, wait on the pruning if you can until after March 16th. You'll probably be able to go from March 16th to about April 16th um, with, with apple trees and peach trees, middle, early April to mid April, and then blueberries, you could prune all the way up to probably April, the end of April. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Allie. Yeah, of course. All right, thank you. Thank you.